This week on the video version of the business of tech, Apple reverses course on right to repair, what do Russian mercenaries, the DoD, and comic books have in common, are ticket-based IT operations antiquated, a new Portuguese law gives ideas for employee perks, and all the stats pointing more towards cloud SaaS domination. All this and more, hit those like and subscribe buttons, and here are this week's stories. I don't like starting the week with a security segment, but when the FBI are hit themselves, well, that feels like the top story. Bureau email servers were hacked and used to distribute spam email impersonating FBI warnings that the recipient's network was breached and data was stolen. Pretending to warn about a sophisticated chain attack, the message warns about a threat from the head of security research of the dark web intelligence companies Night Lion and Shadowbite. The headers are from internal FBI servers, and the FBI did confirm the emails are fake and they're working to resolve the issue. The hacker used a misconfiguration in the law enforcement enterprise portal. The goal was likely to discredit that individual. Showing their commitment to cyber efforts, the U.S. has joined the Paris Call for Trust and Security in Cyberspace, which was established in 2018 to create international norms and laws for cybersecurity and warfare. The Trump administration had previously declined to join. The DOJ announced a Russian man convicted on wire fraud and money laundering charges for his role in the meth bot digital advertising scheme, and he was sentenced to 10 years in prison on Wednesday. It's not all good news from the government. An audit by the General Accountability Office finds that the U.S. Education Department needs to update its plans for responding to cyber attacks against grade schools, as they face a slew of online threats, including ransomware, denial of service attacks, email scams, and pandemic area concerns like disruptions to virtual learning environments. Its planning documents have not been updated since 2010. The audit also revealed that the department believes that protecting schools is CISA's responsibility. The FTC has shared guidance for small businesses on how to secure their networks from ransomware attacks by blocking threat actors' attempts to exploit vulnerabilities using social engineering or exploits targeting technology. The first step businesses are advised to take to fend off such attacks is to ensure their tech teams follow the best practices outlined by CISA in their ransomware guide and the fact sheet on rising ransomware threat to operational technology assets. The second step, addressing the employee's exploitable human nature, is to train staff to recognize the tricks ransomware operators use to infiltrate their target's network, including phishing messages that deliver malware designed to deploy backdoors on infected systems. That from Bleeping Computer. Now why do we care? The FBI hack causes huge confusion as they are the points of contact. I'd anticipate there's a lot of help desk issues across the US right now from that one. The insight from the Department of Education is that assigning responsibility matters. One can see how the department would believe CISA oversees cybersecurity and how others might see the department as the one to take responsibility. If roles aren't clearly defined, no one is in charge. The FTC guidance is another resource for use with clients. The list is ever-growing. Resources from CISA, the FTC, the SBA, all singing a chorus of addressing cybersecurity. Use the resources. The other news I wanted to cover today is from Gartner. The changes that Gartner says are on the horizon will mean major shifts in the way that the world does business over the next few years the result of which Gartner said will be more than 85% of organization embracing a cloud-first strategy by 2025, and 95% of new digital workloads being deployed on cloud-native platforms, up from 30% in 2021. Also in the report, by 2025, 70% of new applications developed by organizations will use low-code or no-code technologies up from less than 25% in 2020. Now, why do we care? This is the area we care about today, clear data showing the state of play. 95% of new workloads cloud native by 2025 and 85% embracing the strategy. As we stare at 2022, that's only three years away. And that's why we care. 
the accelerant of the trend that was happening. This is planning season, so are you planning to get there? Are you cloud first, cloud only? How soon will you be there? Because the market will be there fully in three years, and as technology providers, this doesn't feel like one you want to be last for. Let's do an industry stat roundup. The results from Tech Republic Premium Surveys found that SMBs are still using an array of internal servers, cloud servers, hybrid cloud servers, and SaaS for their IT and business needs. Yet, in 2021, 46% said they rely on on-premise systems, a decrease from last year's response of 63%. This isn't a surprise, as businesses must improve access and collaboration for remote-based employees. Survey results also show that 26% of respondents use more than one cloud service, an increase from the 17% reported in 2020. And 43% said they will tighten their budgets due to COVID-19. Although this is still relatively high, it's a decrease from last year, when 62% forecasted budget changes. A survey of 2,834 subscribers to the Programming and Infrastructure and Ops newsletters published by O'Reilly Media find that nearly half of respondents plan to migrate 50% or more of their workloads to the cloud in the coming year. Just over half of respondents at 55% are also still running workloads on traditional on-premises infrastructure, but nearly half of respondents are now pursuing a cloud-first strategy. After questioning around 9,300 IT workers, Skillsoft found that 76% of IT leaders have skills gaps in their departments, an increase of 145% since 2016. More than half of IT leaders are claiming these skills gaps are adding stress to organizations, with 36% saying skills gaps are preventing them from business objectives, and 42% saying it's stopping them from meeting expected quality objectives. And one detail from Gartner I missed yesterday. The cloud market, sustaining its momentum, is projected to reach $474 billion in global revenue next year, up 16% from 2021. And Gartner research shows 25% of SaaS is underutilized or overdeployed. And in another Gartner report, the analyst says that shadow IT is declining, replaced by SaaS, sanctioned by IT, or approved by the business unit. The concept? Business-led IT. Why do we care? So, story. SMBs are still using a mess, but it's changing down nearly 20% in a year. All sources today, and Gartner yesterday, point to more and more cloud workloads. Budgets may not be generous, but coupled with a skills gap, that might be unrealistic. And best of all, this cloud SaaS push is solving the shadow IT problem, which I was never convinced was really a problem for the business anyway. Shadow IT is caused by a failure of those responsible for IT, not of the business. If technology departments, internal or external, aren't solving the problem, the business isn't going to sit around and wait. I'm a bit of a broken record this week, cloud, cloud, cloud. It's the disconnect I see between what a lot of providers are talking about and where I see the market that's causing that noise to grow was asked recently about contract strategies, and it exposes one of those disconnects. If a provider is pricing based on per-device approaches, well, that ignores the most important element of SaaS. Sure, maybe it's implied, but implied sure isn't cloud first. It's that disconnect I'm thinking about a lot recently. A new law in Portugal. It's now illegal for bosses to text or email employees after work, except in exceptional circumstances. There are penalties for companies that disturb the privacy of staff or their families, and employers must compensate staff for work-related expenses at home. At least every two months, staff should meet with their supervisors in order to prevent worker isolation. The parliament there did not adapt a right to disconnect, which would have allowed employees to turn off work devices and messaging apps after hours. Why do we care? EU listeners care because I don't expect this to be the last. There's a certain logic to protecting workers' rights there. US listeners may be dismissive, and so I want to offer an idea. Why not make this policy? You don't need a law to make a good policy, and in a competitive labor market, why not do this? Codifying sensible policies and being clear about them is a perk. 
There's no dishonor in borrowing great ideas. CompTIA with their new industry outlook. Their headline? A return to acceleration, innovation, and strategy for the IT industry in 2022. The research focuses on 10 trends to watch in 2022, which includes the changing workplace, including both the office and travel, as well regulation and coming changes to the way the industry is managed. The analysts predict both movement in proactive cybersecurity and the fact that most channel firms have a long way to go. Finally, consulting will expand. More channel firms will have a reckoning that reselling products and services in a cloud marketplace era is fading, but they have volumes of opportunity to transform or expand as business consulting experts. While I'm covering data, a bit more saying cloud is it via Tech Republic. 65% of companies increase the use of cloud infrastructure solutions in 2020, but 86% said their usage went up in 2021. The research distinguishes between tech-focused SMBs and traditional ones. For traditional SMBs, the biggest business pain points are recovering from the pandemic and keeping up with the technology curve. For tech-focused companies, the biggest challenges are ensuring technology meets the needs of customers and the needs of the business, in addition to recovering from the impact of COVID-19. And backing up CompTIA's predictions around the office, some 60% of firms are redesigning their offices for the post-pandemic era, according to a new report from the commercial real estate firm CBRE. They looked specifically at firms' headquarters and found that 58% are building auditoriums, 31% have outdoor spaces, and 69% have on-site baristas or coffee shops. And private offices are getting smaller. Around 80% are limiting them to 149 square feet or smaller. Why do we care? CompTIA's industry outlooks are always a good read, and I've linked to the blog. There's a bit of the paper not quite matching the headline. There's a cautious optimism in the paper and a headline that says return to innovation. Ignore the headline. Here's the key passage. Quote, History tells us that you can't stay in bunker mode forever. At some point, you must climb out. Encouragingly, signs point upward and onward as we head into 2022, with a level of cautious optimism creeping back into the technology industry. End quote. The landscape is moving more towards known problems, regulations, security, skills gaps, versus the chaos of 2020. Couple that with digging into the traditional versus tech-focused SMB. I love that lens. Tech-focused ones are better customers for IT services. 44% of traditional SMBs use hosting and infrastructure services compared to 66% of tech-focused ones. There may be a market in moving companies from one to the other, too. Finally, that data on office space. It's bigger companies to be sure, and those listeners do care, but the takeaway for smaller companies is re-examining their space. I wouldn't just be renewing a lease, that's for sure. And there's technology embedded in the move to hot desking. Did you know Cisco helps managed services providers directly know about the Cisco Partner Program? Focused on helping partners combine managed services expertise and service creation with innovative Cisco technology and proven go-to-market resources, there's a program option for you. With provider pricing, MDF, and marketing resources, coupled with Cisco's leading technologies including Meraki, Duo, and Umbrella, learn more with the link right in the show notes. HP is launching a new subscription management service for small and mid-sized businesses that aims to streamline Microsoft Cloud licensing. HP's subscription management offering provides license management for Microsoft 365 and the software giant's cloud catalog. HP also provides analytics and usage data by user, department, and geography so IT teams can shift and scale subscriptions. In addition to right-sizing subscriptions, HP Subscription Management secures remote work applications, optimizes them, and provides ongoing checks. The service also has licensed inventory data as well as spending trends, and this quoting generously from ZDNet. Why do we care? Put one more big company on the list of those offering services directly. Need your Microsoft stuff? Buy VHP. There's a number of smart flavors out there. 
Couple the CompTIA data with this story. If consulting is the big opportunity, this isn't a threat at all. This is a service alignment where consulting is useful regardless. If your core value is helping companies with their technology, this is an entirely in alignment with that. You don't have to use this sure, but assume it's a factor in customers' approaches. In a significant reversal of their stance, Apple announced on Wednesday that customers will be able to repair their own iPhones. Consumers will be able to order the parts, tools, and manuals necessary to fix their own devices starting early next year. The program will start with the iPhone 12 and iPhone 13 in the U.S. and will later expand to M1 Max and other countries throughout the year. To access parts, users will first have to read Apple's repair manual. Then they can place an order for the required tools through Apple's self-service repair online store. The timing here matters. Per reporting in The Verge, Wednesday was a key deadline in a fight over a shareholder resolution environmental advocates filed with the company in September, asking Apple to reevaluate its stance on independent repair. As a result, that resolution is being withdrawn. Why do we care? 27 states with right to repair bills being considered will do that to a company. This isn't out of the goodness of their hearts. This is out of market necessity. Note that this isn't evil either. Their goal is to maximize profit and repair was part of that. It's market and societal pressures that matter here. How did this all come about? Pushes from the market. That's why we care. If you ever think it doesn't work, here's evidence that it does. A survey conducted by Pulse and Hitachi ID through September asked 100 IT and security executives what modifications they're making to their cybersecurity infrastructure, how those changes are able to handle cyber attacks, and how politics plays a role in their strategy. 99% of respondents said that at least some of their security initiatives include a move to SaaS. Some 36% said that more than half of their efforts involve this type of move. Multi-factor authentication has been started by 82% of those surveyed, single sign-on by 80%, identity access management by 74%, and privileged access management by 60%. Only 47% of the respondents said they've executed zero-trust principles and policies. Now, couple that with the culture of the business. Cultures of blame and fear are causing businesses to lose critical, sensitive data that could have otherwise been saved if employees were comfortable enough to come forward. From Veritas Technologies, 56% of office workers admit to having accidentally deleted files hosted in the cloud. 20% do so multiple times a week. 35% of those who admit to accidentally deleting files report lying to cover up what they've done. In 43% of those cases, no one noticed the mistake, meaning that whatever data was lost was never noticed. In 20% of the instances where someone did realize what had happened, the data they had accidentally deleted was gone forever. When it comes to ransomware, employees are even more likely to lie or outright never mention an incident in which they had introduced ransomware to their business network. Only 30% said they would notify IT as to what had happened including their role in it. 24% said they would notify IT, but leave themselves out of the story. 16% would try to recreate the documents they lost to the ransomware, 11% would log out and pretend nothing happened, and 8% said they would do nothing and hope the problem resolved itself. 92% of respondents also have a false belief that cloud providers are able to easily reverse their mistakes. Why do we care? I'm not entirely comfortable with the victim blaming implied in some of this data. The responsibility for the culture is on the business, not the employee. Building a culture of trust takes work. I coupled these two surveys because I think the rollout of these technologies is exactly the time to work on building culture. If you roll out all these tools, but then don't build the culture of trust preventing victim blaming, it's a lot less effective. There's one set of rates to bill for doing just the tech rollouts. There's an even better set of rates for addressing both. The Emotet botnet is back. Another malware botnet, TrickBot, is being used to install it. This after a takedown back in April. 
Also news, it seems Russian-speaking hackers are reaching out to their Chinese counterparts to collaborate. According to a new report by Flashpoint, high-ranking users and ramp administrators are now actively attempting to communicate with new forum members in machine-translated Chinese. Threat actors are also now offering serious money for zero-day exploits, too. Exploits themselves commanding multi-million dollar budgets and a secondary exploit as a service market for those who can't afford it. The gangs now rival nation states with their budgets and reach. They're also great negotiators because they know how much you'll pay before they even hit you. NCC Group Research finds each ransomware gang has created their own negotiation and pricing strategies meant to maximize their profit. There are clear sign adversaries have adopted price discrimination techniques based on the yearly revenue of their victims. A metric, Ransom Per Annual Revenue, or ROR, was created. Small companies generally pay more in ROR, less in absolute amount, but higher in percentage of revenue. The Cybersecurity and Infrastructure Security Agency has released new cybersecurity response plans, known as playbooks, for federal civilian executive branch agencies. CISA's newly published operational procedures are designed to streamline the process of mitigating security vulnerabilities and responding to incidents with the help of easy-to-read decision trees and detailed info for each step. Think big companies don't have issues? A survey featuring some of the United States' top defense contractors suggests that about 20% of them are highly susceptible to a ransomware attack, with 42% having experienced a data breach in 2020 alone. That from Black Kite. 43% of contractors were found to have old or dated cybersecurity systems, yielding a higher risk of cyber attacks. Of course, only 40% of a survey group understand the risks from third parties and their supply chain, per PwC, and 90% of IT decision makers claim their businesses would be willing to compromise on cybersecurity in favor of digital transformation, productivity, or other goals, per Trend Micro. And your newest cultural item? Cheese prices are falling after a cyber attack on one of the U.S.'s largest producers due to backlogs. Why do we care? So you remember that supply chain risk is also you, dear IT outsourcer. You're a risk. From the customer's perspective, you are part of the supply chain too. Sure, you're selling a solution to address security, but you're a risk vector too. The fact that threat actors are now the size of nation states is scary and evidence of the size of their operations. And the data point I'm most focused on is the ransom per annual revenue ratio. This is a smart way of looking at the impact. I've quipped that large companies can write a check to make ransomware go away after the breach. And this is quantification of why. The larger the company, the smaller the ROR. Note that the operators are savvy enough to have intelligence on what they want to get, but still push for a higher ROR. They know the market they can squeeze. More than 9 in 10 employees waste up to 8 hours each week looking through documents to find data for customers, and one-third said AI would make them more responsive, per a survey by Sapio Research. A new study of global tech leaders conducted by PagerDuty found that 78% of senior technical leaders face extra pressure around a growing number of incidents, with 40% reporting that their organizations have lost revenue as a result. The survey found that 72% are accelerating their digital transformation strategies. However, an overwhelming 91% say that traditional IT operations are no longer fit for purpose in the digital era. 62% of respondents say a traditional ticket-based approach to IT operations means IT teams waste time figuring out how to respond to digital incidents. Why do we care? Traditional ticket-based approach to IT operations. That's the phrase that's sticking with me, because it's clearly not viewed as innovative. If the future end state is a digitally transformed business, implied in that series of statements is that addressing it with a traditional ticket-based approach is antiquated. So how many IT providers are screaming right now? I do not profess to have an answer to this one, but if you want to know why we care, it's because of the question, what should it be? Know how I keep talking about broadband? Turns out real estate agents are seeing the impact too. 
In a survey in the UK, one in three owners of houses with broadband speeds of at least 300 megs could expect their homes to be valued at 5,000 pounds more than if it didn't have high-speed broadband. Broadband quality was considered by 20% of those real estate agents as the single most important factor to home buyers, just behind the size of a property, and more important than the number of bedrooms, the age of the property, or access to transport. Why do we care? Second order effects, that's why. What other impact will faster broadband in homes or everywhere have? When I talk about unlocking markets with broadband access, well, that's why. Thanks for tuning in to This Week in the Business of Tech. Shows come out each week, pulling together the daily podcast. If you like this show, please hit that like button and subscribe to the channel. The content is here because of supporters like you. If you want access to shows early, answers to your questions, and private interactions, join our Patreon. It's pay what you want. You decide what the content is worth. Join at patreon.com slash mspradio. Patreons also get access to the written versions of every story as they come out. If you want the stories right away, you can get them on the daily podcast. Find the Business of Tech on Apple Podcasts, Spotify, Google Podcasts, or wherever you get your shows. Subscribe links are at businessof.tech. Talk to you again next week. Thank <laughs> you.